Okay, like I said, there's a chapter we've all been waiting for because in a lot of ways, there have been preludes to this chapter, things that have come before that we kind of needed to address back then, and Mize did address them as we were talking about these people. He talks about when we're thinking about the lineage of Latin American independence and the people who made Latin American independence possible, the great political theorists, and we talked in this class about Simon Bolivar. When's he going to come in? There he is. And uh, the liberator of Latin America, who Mize talks about here again, and Jose Marti, the liberator of Cuba, or someone who's seen as a key person in the liberation movement, so key that they got a statue of himself in New York City. Um, so these are the the guys, the great political guys that uh, the great intellectuals go back to in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, this, this nationalism of, of Latin American countries. And it became, or it, it turned into, in some ways, um, the, from the great men of, of Latin American nationalism, uh, to the sort of mass, what, what we talked about uh, before as the masculinist nationalism of the movements of Latinos in the United States. So that when Latino studies comes in and it comes in as Chicano studies or Puerto Rican studies, and it's fueled by a lot of the, uh, some of the protest movements like the Young Lords, that it enters the scene kind of uh, emphasizing the work of what we might call the great men nationalists and the great men thinkers. And so one of the things that when the Latina feminists burst onto the scene is they do is to try and recuperate some of the things that these great men nationalists had left out. So Mies talks to us here about uh, La Malinche, who is in sort of the, the Mexican intellectual tradition, that of Octavio Paz, seen as a traitor to the country because she, she was the, uh, the, the concubine of, of Cortez, basically was kind of a translator for the conquistadors and is seen as somebody who was you know, a traitor to the Mexican nation and the development of the country. And so one of the things that the feminists, the Latina feminists did was to try and recuperate, to try and, and sort of rethink the role of someone like La Malinche. So on page 63, we read that Chicana feminists have identified how La, La Malinche was abandoned by her family, developed multilingual proficiencies to serve as translator, and navigated complex social relations by strategically developing a close relationship with Cortez. So they're trying to reclaim in some ways the ingenuity and the persistence and the survivability of someone who has been, uh, who, has, who has been seen as a, a, as a bad person by these um, great men, male nationalists. So this is one of the things that the, the, the Latina feminists tried to recapture and to reclaim. Then on page 64, we see Mai's citing a number of books, several of which, hey, that picture is upside down. Huh, how did that happen? Wow, crazy. I think I wanna turn it right side up. See if I can, so strange. Do, do, do. There we go. My goodness. Sorry about that. Hmm. 
So Moise was talking about the, uh, the contribution of the Latina feminists in reclaiming things like La Malinche. He also here cites a number of works which we saw, and I think this exhibit might still be up for those of you who still need to make this one up, in the library exhibit on the banned and challenged books by Hispanic authors. So he talks about here on page 64, uh, a book that some of you uh, uh, talked about, Sandra Cisneros, The House on Mango Street, Woman Hollering Creek, um, a number of other books that didn't make it in the banned category, but Anna Castillo, So Far From God and Massacre of the Dreamers, uh, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents, really great book there, Dreaming in Cuban, and When I Was Puerto Rican. So, and a number of other novels and interventions here uh, by Latina writers and, and thinkers uh, that, you know, have, have not necessarily made it into the mainstream of, of intellectual thought, but are hugely important for these interventions. There's one person in particular here who was in the banned books collection uh, is uh, Gloria Ansel Dua, who we talked about before as someone who wrote a book called Borderlands, La Frontera, one of the few people who was an early on contributor, contributor to Latino studies. And I guess I would say that after that, from page 64 to 66, Mize continues to talk about her work in three edited volumes. Um, and I guess I would say that you, we, it's hard to underestimate the influence of Gloria Ansel Dua when it came to uh, um, radical women of color or Latino, Latina, Latina studies, Latina feminism. One of the first books was called This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, Editors, Editors means it's a collection, so it's, it's, it's work by a number of various authors. Uh, in this case, it was edited by Sherry Moragua, Moraga and Gloria Ansel Dua. Uh, this book was enormously influential. It was so exciting to see people carrying this bright red book around. I remember being in college and being so excited to see this book and people carrying it around. It was so so revolutionary at the time. Um, one of you put on, on, uh, on D2L a great, uh, a great phrase from here that was the phrase of Cherie Moraga that they said that what they were doing was theory in the flesh. Theory in the flesh. So this idea, oftentimes we think of theory as this thing that comes out of the heads or the brains of these you know, great men thinkers sitting around in libraries. And these folks, these women of color were saying, no, what we're doing is a theory that talks to us directly from our lived experiences that has a direct impact upon our bodies. And so, like I said, this first book was enormously influential. Mies began also talks about a second edited volume, this time called Making Face, Making Soul, Haciendo Caras, which came out a few years, or a number of years later, and what he says is that nothing really had, even though that first book had been so revolution and influential, nothing else had really been published along these lines. And so she had to come out with a new edited volume, uh, Creative and Criti Critical Perspectives by Women of Color. And then the third book in this kind of trilogy uh, that she edited, this time uh, Gloria Ansel Dua, And uh, I can't read that very well. Anna Louise Keating, this bridge we call home. And as you can see here, things have kind of gotten a little softer in this final book here. Uh, there, it had a, a sort of more spiritual tone to it. It was more interested in the ecological side of things. So uh, it talks about radical visions for transformation. So we see here a kind of trajectory um, as uh, Ansel Dua got a little bit, uh, how to say, probably aged a little bit and got more concerned about the, her, the spirituality and the environment. She actually uh, passed away in 2004. She uh, was 
at the age of, it would have been the age of 62, which is pretty, pretty young. She had from complications of diabetes, like so many uh, people in, in this field had some, some health issues uh, that were quite sad. And so, you know, some people have criticized her work that she submerged the ideas of Afro-Latinos or Afro-Mexican uh, contributions. Uh, she got some, some kind of harsh words about what she did with some pretty intense sexual scenes in some of these books. But I, like I said, I think it's, it's difficult to underestimate the influence of Ansel Dua on the trajectory of Latina feminism and trying to bring together uh, these kinds of, of writings and ideas over the years. From there, Mies goes more into the social science side of things. And what, uh, what the second part of this, which is called intersectionalities. So trying to think about identity as not simply unidimensional, not just gender, not just race, not just ethnicity. And so he talks about a book called Latinas in the United States, a historical encyclopedia. Um, and so this is kind of, again, trying to, to bring in a compilation of different stories, but in a more social science perspective. He also mentions a book called Unequal Sisters, an inclusive reader in US women's history, which is again, a, an attempt to bring together different parts of people's lives in this idea of intersectionality. A more deliberate kind of a, a work or a couple more deliberate works around the issue of intersectionality appear on page 69. One is a, a book called The Woman in the Zoot Suit. And uh, the zoot suit was a phenomenon that happened mostly in California and in the Southwest where uh, Mexican Americans uh, were sort of appropriating different kinds of uh, a particular clothing style to make a statement uh, during the 1950s and 1960s. Um, you may remember this from earlier in our historical discussion, but here, uh, Catherine Ramirez, is going back into this history and talking about uh, the women who were involved in this and really did not get, uh, were, were kind of pushed out of the movement and written out of the history of this. So the woman in the zoot suit. And then uh, a, another edited volume called Challenging Fronteras, which makes very clear uh, the idea of intersectionality. So what they're talking about here is and I'm quoting on page 69, quote, the intersectionality of race, ethnicity, class, and citizenship affects individual consciousness, intra and intergroup interaction, and each group's access to institutional power and privilege. So what is happening here is we have at first a, a kind of what we might consider a straight up feminist critique from the, from the standpoint of gender, but as this develops, it's the idea that there is race, ethnicity, class, and citizenship along with gender that all have to be considered together. So that's what uh, many people in the, in the uh, when you take a social science class and they talk about intersectionality, that's what they're in some ways trying to get at is the ways in which these identities and positions uh, interact uh, for various people. I want to talk about, before we talk about uh, the, the queer Latinidades, queer theory and queer Latinidades, I want to jump ahead a tiny bit to page 72, uh, where we see uh, Gutman and others writing a book called The Meanings of Macho. And what Gutman was trying to do here is a really interesting photograph. He was an anthropologist and he had this photograph of a Mexican uh, a Mexican uh, man in Mexico City uh, carrying this baby very lovingly, uh, which is actually was not even his. And what he did for his field work is he took this picture around and showed it to people and asked them what they thought of it. And he got a, a very wide range of answers. And his big point is that macho has lots of different meanings. 
And it doesn't have to be in some ways this stereotypical machismo of, you know, having, of, of uh, being kind of uh, unfaithful and, 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 um, and, and not, very, not very good at home, that uh, macho can also mean being a good father, being a good provider, um, and so that it has a whole different range of meanings apart from this stereotype that it, that it had. And I write this partially because uh, at the end of this chapter, in the conclusion part of this, uh, Mies talks about the idea of revolutionary machismo. So if you remember back to the Young Lords and their 10 point program, one of the points in that program was that machismo must be revolutionary and not oppressive. This was point number five. And what Mies says is that the feminists in this movement or the women in the Young Lords movement were able to rewrite that whole point. And so they scored a very uh, kind of a decisive victory on the ground, you might say. Then they said, for the Lords women, I mean, they said the new point number five now read, we want equality for women, down with machismo and male chauvinism. So there was a kind of a, a shift here where, where the men in this movement wanted to make revolution in machismo and the women said, no, that's not going to work. And there's a great quote here uh, right in the middle of that page. Machismo was never going, was never going to be revolutionary. Saying revolutionary machismo is like saying revolutionary racism. So, you know, a pretty really, uh, a kind of an, a very uh, scathing critique of this idea that machismo could simply be, be marshaled for uh, revolutionary ends. And in this case, they actually did uh, win that political victory and rewrote uh, the, the text of the, the Young Lords program. I'm gonna talk here, the third part of this chapter is about the idea of, uh, of queer theory. And it begins with some works uh, by uh, Jose Esteban Munoz, who uh, also uh, tragically passed away at the age of 46, a uh, very untimely death. He wrote a, a couple books, which uh, Mize mentions here. Uh, the first one, um, the first one was called, um, I think it was, let's see, let me get the, the uh, the right name here. All right, the first one was called Disidentifications, Queers of Color and the Performance of Politics. And the second one, which uh, Mize discusses a little bit more here in the scene as, as, as perhaps a, a, a richer book, is called Cruising Utopia, The Then and There of Queer Futurity. So what's, Super, I think, interesting and, and sadly, like I said, the, uh, um, Munoz has, has passed away and, and uh, is at an untimely age at a time when he was, he was really just beginning to make these incredible contributions. A couple interesting things here. I mean, first of all, the idea of queer theory in general, uh, which has to do, and one of you put this up on D2L, which is has to do with the idea um, that identity is not fixed, but rather a set of performances. And so uh, queer theory draws upon this, this idea that in some ways the identity that we supposedly have and we supposedly identify as is not necessarily a fixed for life thing, that people have various performances that they do in relationship to the structures that they have. And uh, it's, uh, Munoz's work, uh, especially in this Cruising Utopia book, is super interesting because he takes this a step further in that uh, unlike some of the kind of, uh, we might say the, the white queer theory folk, uh, he was thinking about how this led to the idea of collectivity. Um, the idea that people could come together uh, in various ways. And other people have said, and it's it, in some of these memories of his life, that 
too often uh, queer theory was thought to be something very individual. And he's really trying to imagine uh, a, a collectivity or a collective framework for it, which comes up in on the also on page 71 in this book called Queer Migration Politics, which talks about activist rhetoric and coalitional possibilities. So again, this idea that we can do a kind of collective action or make coalitions around certain issues and that performance doesn't necessarily mean only an individualizing identity, but it can be used to make different kinds of coalitions and different kinds of collectives. Fascinating uh, work leading up to some really, uh, really interventional art uh, and interesting uh, campaigns around the idea of being, un I am undocu queer, and there's actually an undocu queer hashtag and an undocu queer manifesto you can look at on, on YouTube. Uh, I think this work is most associated with Julio Salgado. And so uh, this was one of the uh, one of one of his works uh, quoting uh, quoting Imelda here. Uh, so you know, I mean, I think in some ways, uh, some people have talked about this work as you know trying to uh, both to as coming out of two closets, both as queer and as undocumented, and talking again about in some ways an intersectional relationship of these, but also trying to use that in different ways uh, to be liberational or to be uh, to change society or uh, to form new kinds of uh, groups and new kinds of collectivity. 